Okay, Christine, I'll hand over to you. I think we're good to go for the keynote. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Lisa. Welcome back, um, everyone. And again, congratulations to, to all of you um, organizers and participants. It's been fantastic so far, such wonderful topics and vibrant conversation, but I will get on and do what I've been asked to do immediately. And that is with great pleasure uh, to introduce my, my colleague, uh, Professor Brian McGing. And Brian is the Emeritus Regis Professor of Greek in Department of Classics in Trinity College, Dublin, and a, a much respected and much loved colleague. So we, we miss him very much. And it's great to see him um, on uh, Zoom. And for those of you who don't know him, just a, a little few, few things um, about his work. So he's an ancient historian um, and he has worked on the Hellenistic period in Asia Minor. He's worked uh, a lot on Greco Roman and Greco-Hellenistic Egypt and has a great expertise in papyrology, which our students have been superbly privileged to uh, be taught about at times. And he's working on papyri um, in the Chester Beatty Library, uh, which is a wonderful collection here in uh, Dublin. He's also recently published a critical edition of Appian's Roman History, and Brian, if I get this wrong, I think there are six volumes of it. Is that oh, right? I counted correctly. An extraordinary um, output then of the, those red um, volumes, aren't they? Green, green. They're green. Oh no, I got it wrong. <laughs> okay, and it's being recorded. Okay, so that that, that that's his most recent um, huge output. In the context of this conference, where we've been talking about widening our conversations of interdisciplinarity and the the, the geographical areas of what we talk about. I'd like to mention one other uh, thing that Brian was at the helm of, together with um, Sean Frayne, our colleague in biblical studies, um, and that was the setting up and, and government funding um, of a project called Mediterranean and Near Eastern Studies, um, which was, uh, as it describes, encompassed thinking about and having dialogue with um, all of the different cultures and civilizations in the Mediterranean and Near East. And I, I, I think when we were all working working on that quite a many years ago now, we can see that, that, that the conversation about this is even more important um, and pressing than um, then. Um, so uh, without uh, more ado, I will ask Brian then to um, give his um, lecture, his keynote speech, From Polybius the Historian to Polybius the Computer Game, A Greek Author's Career Outside the Groves of Academe. Thank you, Brian. Thanks. Uh... Christine, I, I assume I can be uh, heard and uh, seen if that's uh, desirable. Uh, I feel I should, uh, it, the, um, the term keynote worries me a bit, it, it, this should be incredibly wise and uh, encompass uh, so much of what we've been uh, hearing uh, today, which has been uh, superb. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not going to do that, uh, I am going to try to answer the question, what have the ancients ever done for us, at least in relation to, to, to one person from uh, the ancient world. In uh, Portland, Oregon in 1981, a new arcade game uh, appeared, so it was claimed 20 years later. It was a dangerously addictive game causing insomnia, uh, amnesia, hallucinations, Men in black removed unknown data from it at intervals, and a month after it first appeared, it disappeared without trace. No consoles of the original game have been found. The name of the game was Polybius. For those of you who are not Greek historians or Greek history experts, Polybius was a soldier and a leading Achaean politician of the second century BC, who wrote a history in 40 volumes of Rome's dramatic rise to world power during the third and second centuries BC. Only the first five books are preserved in full and much of book six, which contains Polybius' most famous and influential analysis of how the Roman state functioned. Byzantine excerpts provide some extensive sections of the later books. The purpose of the elaborately constructed story of that arcade game is presumably easy enough to understand. As Wikipedia explains, and I didn't understand all that it tried to explain, uh, the urban legend has persisted as a topic of interest for video games, journalism, and through continued interest, it has served 
as inspiration for free and commercial video games by the same name. Polybius is also the name, also the name, uh, of a classical Greek historian born in Arcadia and known for his assertion that historians should never report what they can't verify through interviews with witnesses. Well, I'm not sure that's what Polybius is known for particularly at all, actually, but, but the story was clearly devised to promote video games. And the name Polybius sum, summons up, I, I suppose, an image of ancient reliability. The uh, explanatory video that I watched, and, and there, are, there are lots of them, you can spend quite a lot of time doing this, uh, it had sinister sound effects and excellent uh, entertainment, uh, is I assume all part of the, uh, the same backstory. It adds a little about the name. It, I think, mistranslates the name Polybius as meaning many lives. I, I think it must be surely singular, much life, that is the long lived one, something like that. But it also highlights the real attraction for an arcade game. Polybius came from Arcadia, so he represents playing many lives in arcade land. Human beings have always used the past for a wide uh, variety of different purposes. In the modern world, classical past of Greece and Rome uh, has been taken above all to bestow authority on what you have done, are doing, or want to do. Often, probably more often, something morally reprehensible. Polybius, the arcade game comes at I would imagine the more harmless end of the, the spectrum of use of the past, uh, where an ancient name with perhaps one or two attributes, attributes attached to it merely gives a sort of dignity or authority to something you're trying to promote. The same goes, I assume, for the cryptocurrency bank founded in 2017 called Polybius. I read from a financial journal here. Uh, the Polybius project established by the Estonian company Polybius Foundation is a digital crypto project focused on creating a financial institution that uses blockchain technology. The Polybius Foundation's main product is OSOM, uh, an artificial intelligence powered trading algorithm that automatically locates growth opportunities for investors. My advice would be probably not to invest in the Polybius Bank. It took off at a great rate, but I think it, it's stalled since then. I couldn't see in the literature any explanation for the name, although I suspect it has to do with the so-called Polybius Square, um, a, a signaling device invented by two earlier Greeks, Cleopsinus and Democlitus, but made famous by Polybius. One of the first things uh, Polybius uh, talks about right at the beginning of his work is the usefulness of history. And he didn't mean useful in some vague, theoretical, touchy-feely way. Uh, history gave practical lessons on living, particularly for soldiers and politicians. To be a successful politician, you had to be a historian. And the reverse holds true as well. You couldn't be a historian without being a politician. So I want to look today very briefly at first the afterlife of Polybius' work in the modern world, where it had a practical effect on actions or thinking that are not to do with classical scholarship or the study of uh, the ancient world. And second, I also want to consider again very briefly how we might uh, still use uh, Polybius in the contemporary world, not as an educational tool, uh, we've been talking about that in relation to Latin and other things, but, but as a modern analyst, uh, applied, applied Polybius, so to speak. I start with uh, an unlikely uh, subject, military history, as part of the uh, Roman, whole, whole Roman system of government in, in Book 6, there's a substantial section on the organization of the Roman army. And for a time in the 16th and 17th centuries, this section had a practical influence on the conduct of war, uh, warfare in Europe. The major reason for this was provided by a graduate and later professor of the University of Leuven, probably its most distinguished son, Justus Lipsius. Lipsius was 
better known for other accomplishments, but in 1595, he wrote a work entitled Five Books on the Roman Army, a commentary on Polybius. Both Lipsius and an Italian predecessor, Francesco Patrizzi, believed that modern armies could be improved by the application of Roman organization and discipline. Lipsius' work became famous because it was given almost immediately to a former student of his, Morris of Nassau, Prince of Orange, who had studied uh, with him at Leiden in 1583 to four when Lipsius was professor of history there. Morris adopted the lessons of Lipsius' work, work in a practical way in reforming his own army and under his leadership, the Dutch revolt against Spain was successful. For a time then, Polybius had actually a direct effect on European warfare. I've taken this aspect of modern reception out of chronological order because the realities of modern warfare uh, fairly quickly made Polybius' military contribution redundant. He had, in fact, first come to the notice of Florentine scholars at uh, the beginning of the 15th century as a valuable source for the history of Rome. But it was uh, Machiavelli, a century later, who established Polybius' relevance to the practice of contemporary politics. And it is this role as a political scientist that has secured Polybius' fame in the modern world. Polybius described in book six what he called the cycle of constitutions, the process by which states decline from the three basic and benign forms of government, kingship, aristocracy, and democracy, decline into their equivalent bad forms. Thus, having brought order to a chaotic world, kingship uh, degenerates into tyranny, which is then replaced by uh, the good form, aristocracy. Aristocracy degenerates into oligarchy, which is replaced by democracy, and democracy becomes mob rule, uh, which leads to the collapse of the state into chaos, out of which kingship emerges and restarts the cycle. Bolivia's description was copied very closely by Machiavelli in his discourses on the first 10 books of uh, Livy. Machiavelli also uses Polybius' analysis of the mixed constitution, that's his main claim to form, uh, fame, Polybius' main claim to fame, uh, a mixed form uh, that is one in which kingship, aristocracy, and democracy are the constituent and balanced parts. For present purposes, I just want to emphasize that Machiavelli's approach to uh, Polybius was not theoretical or antiquarian. He, he was using Polybius as a practical handbook for the improvement of contemporary political practice in Italy. The founding fathers of the Constitution of the United States were well shown, thoroughly educated in the literature and history of the Greek and Roman world, particularly the Roman and particularly the Roman Republic. Polybius was well known to many of them. There were several copies of Polybius in Thomas Jefferson's library, and he talks about buying copies in his letters. James Monroe read passages of Polybius at the Virginia State Convention called to ratify the federal constitution, and he was standard reading for anyone engaged in the constitutional discourse. The attraction was the theory of mixed government. This was the only way of slowing the cycle of constitutional decline, um, of staving off for as long as uh, possible the inevitable decline of, of the republic they were founding. The best insurance the founding fathers could devise against the future was a mixed constitution tempered by the separation of powers and representative government. Nowhere is this clearer, actually, than in the writings of, of John Adams, the second president and uh, most fervent supporter of, of mixed government. Uh, his uh, defense of the constitutions of government of the United States of America in 1787 has large parts taken directly from Polybius, whom he uh, greatly admired. Uh, mixed government was, of course, a strange idea in America, which most silently 
was not going to have a king and did not have an aristocracy. But of course, the idea was flexible. Uh, the president or governor of a state would be the monarchical element, the Senate, the aristocratic, and the popular assembly, uh, the democratic. I, it would be nice to delay in, uh, in America and uh, talk with uh, Aidan uh, Poling much more about Washington. I thought found his paper really interesting. Uh, but uh, I've got to move on. What I want to emphasize again is that just as for Machiavelli, for the founding fathers too, their use of Polybius was not, I think, just illustrative or a search for ancient authority and wait to support what they were going to do anyway. It really was a, a, an inspiring force. After this uh, great burst of uh, glory uh, that saw Polybius influence in a practical, practical way the course of 18th century politics, the histories became very largely the preserve of classical scholarship, although Polybius has always retained an honored place at the table of political scientists. And at this table, he has enjoyed a recent return to prominence. In the year 2000, uh, Michael Hart and Antonio Negri published uh, a, a sort of neo-Marxist analysis of the present world order called Empire. Interesting book, large chunks of it, almost impenetrable. They argued that uh, the nation states have been replaced by a new structure, which they call Empire, that they explicitly model on Polybius mixed constitution. It's an extraordinary adaptation. The monarchic element of the order is provided by the military power of the United States and its allies and the financial power of uh, that group as seen in the well, G18, G15, I can't remember how many are, are in the G groups, group of nations. The aristocratic element is now the multinationals and na nation states and the democratic is NGOs, the United Nations, for instance. The analogy is only a structural one. This is not some, as it was for Polybius, some desirable and stable government that will now rule the world like Rome. Uh, and indeed, in the following two books of uh, extraordinary trilogy, Multitude, the second, Commonwealth, the third, Hart and Negri see the eventual, eventual triumph of the new multicultural proletariat. Empire does offer a global interpretation, which Marxism did in the first place. And this undoubtedly reflects the universal views of Polybius. One of the demands that Polybius makes frequently throughout his work is that in order to understand the world, you must write universal history, not monographs on separate subjects. You can only understand what's going on by studying the whole. His reason for this insistence was his contention that world history now at the end of the third century BC from then on uh, had become one story, an organic whole. And that story for Polybius, excuse me, was Rome. The only effective way to write about the situation was to weave all the strands of events into a single cloth and his structure and method of writing put this weaving analogy into practice. In a number of recent articles, two British sociologists, uh, David Inglis and Roland, Roland uh, Robertson, have emphasized this global aspect of Polybius thinking. They reject Hart and Negri's adaptation of Polybius mixed government, finding the analogy to strain to be useful. And I, I think they're right in all honesty, it's interesting, but certainly very strained, but they do argue that historiographically Polybius provides the original model of how to think and write globally. They could have gone back to Herodotus perhaps. In effect, they say Polybius can be seen as an important ancestor of the current social scientific drive to develop a global imaginary. So for them, Polybius is like the, the father of globalization theory. Polybius mixed constitution comes into play in um, more recently in a paper produced by an international financial consultancy, BCA Research. I do not know it. They describe themselves as 
the leading independent provider of global investment research. Since 1949, BCA Research's mission has been to shape the level of conviction with which our clients make investment decisions through, through the delivery of leading edge analysis and forecasts of all the major asset classes and economies. That's them talking about themselves. The paper I'm referring to is entitled The Polybius Solution. It's BCA Research, 5th of July, 2019, if you're interested. And it is actually interesting. It argues that in the context of US-China relations, Polybius mixed constitution provides a solution to the uh, so-called Thucydides trap. I don't know if people have come across this, a term devised by Harvard political scientist uh, Graham Allison to describe the inevitable, inevitable threat of war when an established power, Sparta in the USA, he says, is challenged by a young and ambitious newcomer, Athens, China. Well, the, the Thucydides trap has gained huge tra traction. Well, ha have a look for yourselves. I'm not sure I fully accept the validity of it. It involves what I think is a distinctly misleading translation of Thucydides 1.23, where he famously sets out the real reason for uh, the Peloponnesian War. I, I, I think all the same, there is something to the equation that, uh, uh, that Alison sets up. Uh, and I'm not sure at all that uh, the BCA research report is reliable in its analysis of what uh, Polybius argued. I'm not quite sure how he, he sees it. It's a mixed constitution that he, that he latches onto. It would need uh, some time to disentangle and uh, we're not going to do that now. And I haven't actually done it thoroughly myself. But I suppose for present purposes, regardless of the validity of the analysis, analysis, it is striking that a serious investment consultancy might seek help from Polybius in devising its strategic financial advice in the uh, realm of US-China relations. I'm not quite sure how seriously to take it. The paper appears to offer a serious engagement with Polybius. It's not just a passing reference. Uh, the, the author really is trying to, I think, uh, engage with Polybius, but I can't help feeling that it's forced and that more probably it comes into the category, that category of, of people seeking authority by recourse to an ancient author, but I, I'll, I'll hold uh, judgment on that. I want to um, finish with a, a, a few thoughts on other constitutional and political themes and view, views developed by Polybius uh, that were not picked up by the founding fathers, for instance, or by later political scientists or economists, but which might bear on present political circumstances, particularly actually on President Trump, his campaign for re-election and his direction of the government of the United States. One of the themes in Polybius are of relevance to politics in any era, it, it seems to me, is the strong connection he makes between the abandonment of successful policies and the decline of power. There is nothing very advanced or complicated about this analysis. It is simply that the notion that the policies that brought success and power to you or your institution, organization, nation, in the first place, are the ones you should pursue to maintain that success and power. Failure to do so will lead to decline. In 211 BC, for example, when Roman forces captured Syracuse during the war against Hannibal. They plundered the city, stripping it of all its artworks and ornaments and taking them back to Rome. Polybius regarded this as a mistake. If the Romans had become great by doing this sort of thing, it would have been right to continue to do so. But if, he says, on the contrary, while leading the simplest of lives, very far removed from all such superfluous magnificence, they were constantly victorious over those who possessed the greatest number and finest examples of such works, 
how can we fail to believe that they made a mistake? To abandon the ways of the victors and to imitate those of the conquered is surely an incontestable error. Quote from book nine. It was something, I mean, there are other examples, but it was something the Carthaginian commanders failed to understand after their successful expansion in Spain in the second half of the third century, just before the, the war, the Hannibalic War. For they suppose, he said, that there is one way of acquiring power and another for maintaining it. They did not understand that the people who are best at preserving their supremacy are those who adhere to the same principles by which they originally established it. That's from uh, book 10. On an individual level, Polybius clearest example of the decline that results from abandoning successful policies is provided by the king who ruled Macedon from 221 to 179 BC, Philip V. When he first came to the throne, Polybius says, he possessed a quick intelligence, a retentive memory and great personal charm, as well as the presence and authority that becomes a king and above all ability and courage as a general. These qualities inspired, uh, Polybius says, in questioning loyalty and admiration throughout the Greek world, and he conferred so many benefits on all the Greeks that you could call him the darling of Greece. But he abandoned these successful ways and changed from a king into a savage tyrant. He's one of a, sort of a practical example of that part of the uh, constant cycle of constitutions, changing from a bad soul ruler, in, a good soul ruler into a bad one. As he totally changed his principles, Polybius wrote, it was inevitable that he should also totally reverse other men's opinion of him and that he should meet with totally different results in his undertakings. The effects of this change were seen, for example, in his predatory sexual behavior. He no longer confined himself, Polybius writes in book, ten to seducing widows or corrupting married women, but used to send for and order any woman he chose to come to him and insulted those who did not at once obey his orders. And on the whole, he behaved in a most outrageous and lawless manner. His reign declined into disastrous defeat by Rome and his personal life into tragedy. Polybius judgment on the qualities that, that make a good ruler, and he says quite a lot on the, on the matter, uh, would certainly have precluded him from regarding President Trump's behavior as anything other than most outrageous and lawless. But Polybius could hardly have faulted Mr. Trump on the consistency of that behavior without taking into account the qualities or failings of his opponent in 2016. It's clear that he was elected president because a sufficient number of people were attracted to or at least not put off by his abrasive, aggressive and mostly angry personal demeanor, his dislike of foreigners, his straight talking and in general his contrarian refusal to accept the norms of behavior laid down by tradition and by the existing political elite, the swamp. Although some wondered whether after his election, I remember commentary like this, wondered whether he might become presidential and in the commas in the traditional manner, uh, this did not happen and was never likely to. It's hard to imagine. Mr. Trump would have been any good at it. And his instinct not to change his tune by a single note was on Polybius reasoning, reasoning surely correct. So why did he lose? Well, I, there's, I'm sure lots of bits of different reasons. At least one would be that the contribution of personal behavior to the retention of power, although it can be important, is only part of the presidential or the political equation, there remains, of course, the much bigger question of, of the policies you pursue as president, king, prime minister. Being a contrarian with regard to personal style and tone is all very well, but bringing the same uh, willful determination uh, to do everything differently in the policy arena uh, would, in Polybius' estimation, spell disaster for the United States.
Mr. Trump himself raised the matter of America's status in the world and promised to make it great again, stopping the American carnage, as he called it. But his dystopian assessment of the abyss into which the United States had sunk was expressed in only the vaguest of rhetorical terms. And more importantly, from a Colombian perspective, he made no discernible attempt to identify in any detail anyway that the policies that had made America great in the first place. And here, Polybius would surely be aghast at and regard as madness the voluntary retreat of the United States from its various roles of global leadership. This was a trend, uh, it is true, underway before Mr. Trump's arrival on the scene, but by romancing dictatorial regimes, insulting allies, walking away from the network of international organizations, friendships, and agreements that made America leader of the free world, he greatly accelerated the downward spiral of American influence and power and the respect in which it is held. For Polybius, this would all amount to an incontestable error and inevitably lead to the decline of the United States. The change of Philip V of Macedon from king to tyrant uh, highlights another aspect of Polybius' constitutional considerations not relevant to the founding fathers, except uh, in as far as it was something to avoid, and, and that is the, the, the cycle of constitutions. The cycles are perhaps not prominent in uh, current political discourse. Um, on the whole, I think they're making a comeback. Uh, the American historian Arthur Schlesinger proposed his father had Horn as well, most prominently in his book, 1986 book, The Cycles of American History. Uh, he'd proposed, or they had proposed, an alternation between liberalism and conservative, conservatism in American politics, the self-generating nature of which owes something to the organic nature of Polybius' cycle. Polybius is a completely a natural biological cycle. Schlesinger references Polybius specifically, as does the uh, 2020 study of the professor of constitutional law at Yale University, uh, Jack Belkin, the cycles, a book called The Cycles of Constitutional Time, just, just available actually, and got it recently. Really interesting book. Belkin identifies three cycles in American politics, the cycle of the rise and fall of political regimes, the cycle of polarization and depolarization, and the cycle of constitutional rot and renewal. There's no time uh, to look in more detail at this, but Balkan's um, topics and concerns are, are strongly Polybian. Uh, where are we in political time, he asks, and that's exactly what uh, Polybius asked on more than one occasion. And the emphasis on decline and change into the next part of, uh, of the cycle, uh, again, um, very Polybian. Uh, and he, he's aware of Polybius, he's moved on from it, he's not using him as a, a model in detail, but uh, Polybius certainly is in the background. Interestingly, while the lessons of recent history in other parts of the world might point to the, I would have thought, the greater likelihood of democracy degenerating into tyranny, actually, than as Polybius would maintain into mob rule. Um, Balkan, who was writing just before the uh, United States election, believed that Trump uh, represents the end of a cycle started by Ronald Reagan, and that the Democrats would start a new cycle. He got it right. He wasn't actually making a prediction about the election, but he said at some stage, sometime soon, it would happen. Polybius' intense interest in constitutional change would certainly have had him raising the question of whether um, uh, President Trump was leading the United States to the very borders of democracy and threatening to cross that frontier into dictatorship. For Polybius, the Trump presidency would be a clear indicator of the decline of American power and a guarantee of its continuing, continuing downward trend. Balkan interestingly, is, is, 
is much more optimistic. Polybius was an out and out imperialist, part of the ancient discourse that glorified empire or unquestioningly, uh, unquestioningly accepted it. And that is a discourse, of course, unfortunately, that the academic discipline of history in the 19th century, influenced by the academic discipline of classics and the uh, uh, analysis of ancient empire, it's a, uh, a discourse that was gleefully adopted in uh, the policy that policy leading uh, support of the British Empire. Recent book I read, uh, uh, interesting one on empire, uh, describes the British Empire, and it could apply to uh, the Roman Empire just as well, as an autocratic, racist, violent, uh, and extractive form of rule. Not everything ancient authors said are admirable or to be copied, but and they can, as we know so well in the present age, be misused for nefarious purposes, but they can also be useful with careful critical attention. Although they will never solve modern problems, when used honestly and carefully, they sometimes provide insights or new perspectives on modern issues and suggest lines of investigation or courses of action. Polybius knew little of democratic elections and, there were, and he was certainly no profound philosophical thinker, but he was one of the best political analysts of the ancient world and had a practical understanding of how power worked, how to gain it and how to keep it. Modern politicians could do a lot worse than read the Polybius. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brian, so much for that. Um, we're just going to take a quick break there um, and then we'll come back and everybody can ask Brian lots of questions as well as our other featured uh, speakers. And uh, that'll be about five minutes. I misspoke in the chat um, just so that we can get organized here. So uh, thanks very much and just hold on one moment. <laughs> 